Okay, so I wanted to just give a little bit of information around the energy that's involved in phase changes. Remember, heat and other forms of energy, they're always changing forms. They're always going from one form to another. Uh, and heat always flows, like everything else, from where there's a lot to where there's a little. So if there's more in the surroundings, it's going to flow into and be absorbed by uh, the system, whatever the system is. And if the system has more heat energy, more vibrational energy in the particles, then they're going to bump into the particles at the edge of the surroundings and ultimately that heat dissipates. So when we talk about phase change, we're not changing the molecular structure of anything. We're just talking about how the intermolecular forces are holding it together, either very tightly in a regular pattern more loosely but still very much connected to each other sliding around that would be a liquid or with a whole bunch of space flying around at high speed which would be a gas so each of those involves an input or a release of energy so when we talk about the energy that's involved in the phase change we're really talking about where energy is going to change and disrupt or is re being released to the surroundings because there's the formation of uh, attractions between particles, specifically between molecules. So either London dispersion forces or dipole interactions like hydrogen bonding. So if you look at the graph over here, so here's a heating or if we're going the other way, it would be cooling curve for any sort of solid. So we start when it's below its freezing point temperature, whatever that is. So like, let's say this is water. So if I had water at negative 10, negative 20 degrees Celsius at a really cold freezer. Okay, so I took ice out that's negative 20 and I put it in a beaker and I put a thermometer in there and I see it's negative 20. Of course, it's already going to start absorbing heat energy from the surroundings from the room and begin to heat up to the point where it can melt. But let, I, let's say I put this on a, a hot plate and I turn the heat on and the temperature goes up, the temperature goes up, and then we hit this point right here where the temperature really doesn't go up that much. But if we were to look in the beaker, we see that already some of that ice had started to liquefy and progressively more and more and more of it turns to liquid, but the temperature doesn't really change a whole bunch. It might begin to creep up depending on where the thermometer is and how much of it's more watery versus ice. Uh, at some point when almost all of the ice is gone and what we're really measuring is the temperature of the liquid, then the temperature starts to go up again. So I'm putting heat in through this whole little range here. I'm putting energy in, but the thermometer isn't moving because instead the energy is going to disrupt the interactions between the particles that are holding them in that solid crystalline structure. Okay, so that's what melting is. Melting is the, the, the state where both a solid and liquid exist at a particular temperature. And this is also a function of the pressure of the environment, but we're just going to keep this under constant pressure. So let's just talk about it at sea level pressure so we don't uh, add another variable here. We want to just look at the energy flow. So under constant pressure, there is a temperature at which the heat energy of the environment allows for the particles, the vibrational energy of the particles to begin to move to the point where uh, the dipole interactions that we're talking about, water molecules, the hydrogen bonds, are beginning to loosen up so that water molecules can slide around each other and become more liquidy. Okay, so once it's all liquid, hot, 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 as it approaches 100 degrees Celsius, we reach another point where the temperature begins to level off. Now, if the thermometer is just in the water, it's not gonna go above 100 because liquid water at one atmosphere of pressure doesn't exist above 100 degrees. That's where it becomes a vapor. So the the state at where where it's going through that transition. Again, heat energy is going in, but instead of raising the temperature, it's disrupting the attractions. Okay, energy is always going somewhere. It's just the question of what's it doing? Is it making the particles move faster, or is it actually stretching and breaking apart? the attractions that are holding them in the state they're in. Right? If we're able to continue to measure the temperature of the steam, 
um, then we could, in theory, make that steam go higher, which is why steam can burn you even more than boiling water than the water itself, because it can be at a higher temperature. So we call the process now, this happens at the same temperature. So if I'm adding heat energy, I take a solid, I melt it. But if I have a liquid and I'm taking the heat out, then I'm freezing it. It's the same temperature and it's the same amount of energy involved. It's just, is that energy being put into the system, like adding to the ice, or is it being released from the system? In other words, being sucked out of the water into the surroundings, like if you're in a freezer. So we call the amount of energy needed to melt something, it's heat of fusion. Now it seems very odd and I don't know the history behind it, but if I had to guess, it's because it's really also the heat of solidification and somewhere along the line, fusion got related with the melting part. It just is what it is. I'd have to go back and look up the history. Um, but the delta H or the enthalpy of fusion is the energy necessary, necessary for melting. For melting, it's the amount of kilojoules needed to melt one mole, to transition one mole from a solid to a liquid. And solidification, it's the same amount of energy, it's just going in the other direction. So uh, if you're adding heat energy into the system, all right, so melting is an endothermic process. You, this, the system, the ice, if you want to keep that image, has to absorb the heat energy. So you put a piece of ice in your hand, it's going to melt. It feels cold because your hand is warmer and the heat energy in your hand is going into the ice. So it's leaving you and going in to the ice to turn it to water. Um, solidification is the opposite kind of situation. Put the water in the ice tray and put it in the freezer. The surrounding air, which is always circulating, is lower in temperature than the water is. And so heat energy is being absorbed into the, into the surroundings. And as that energy is released from the water, it becomes, the, the molecules move around less. And so then the hydrogen bonding interactions become more prominent in holding each water molecule kind of more or less where it is and only allow it to shake and move around with a certain vibrational energy, but it forms a crystalline structure, okay? It's the same amount of energy. If I'm putting it in, it's positive because it's endothermic. And if I'm turning a liquid into a solid, then I'm taking it out, which means for the system, that's a negative heat exchange, but it's the same value. And it's going to be the same thing when we talk about uh, boiling or vaporizing and condensing. So if you come over here and like, so here's water, right? Uh, at zero degrees Celsius, 601 kilojoules for every mole of ice or every mole of water, right? If I have a mole of ice, for every mole of ice, I have to put in 6.01 kilojoules of energy to turn it all into liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. At 100 degrees Celsius, it's going to take 40.7 kilojoules of energy for every mole of liquid water I have to put in to turn it into steam. And likewise, if I cool the steam and turn it into water droplets, 40.7 kilojoules of energy needs to come out for those water molecules to begin to stick to each other and form droplets. So I wanted to highlight it because I had the table on that page, but heat vaporization and condensation, it's the same thing. It's the same value. It's just a question of, is it positive, meaning I'm heating it up and turning it into a gas, or is it negative, meaning that the heat's coming out because I'm taking the gas and cooling it down to a liquid? So application, here's a math problem, okay? We can look at how much heat energy is absorbed by 200 grams of ice as it melts at zero degrees Celsius. And again, I put it right here from that table. The heat of fusion of water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Those are table values at a set pressure, okay? At one atmosphere, at sea level. Okay, um, so those are table values. Those are things that can be looked up. So if we have 200 grams, well, how many moles? 
So first step, convert to moles. And then if we have moles, then we can convert to kilojoules using that heat of fusion value. So to melt 200 grams of ice, it would take 67.8 kilojoules of energy to melt it. And that's sort of the skinny version. I mean, you could make it more elaborate in terms of, oh, well, if I have ice at 20, negative 20, and uh, how much energy are you going to take to turn into steam? Well, there's multiple steps, right? You could do uh, delta H equals MC delta T to go from negative 20 to zero. And then at zero, how many grams do you have? How many moles do you have? How much energy at 6.01 kilojoules per mole? And then you could do another MC delta T to go from zero to 100. And then at that point, however much water it was or however much of whatever substance it was, uh, times its heat of vaporization, however many moles it is, times its heat of vaporization, and then it would all be steam. And then you'd have to add them all up. So you could make this a longer problem and combine what, what was in my last video about um, just calculating enthalpy change, mass times specific heat times change in temperature. When you're going through the phase change, there's no change in temperature. The energy is going to actually induce the change. So you have to account for that as well. Okay, so here, there you go. That's all of the stuff about enthalpy of phase changes, what happens during a phase change. Again, we're measuring and talking about this right now at a constant pressure at one atmosphere of pressure. So those table values are one atmosphere of pressure. If we change the pressure, we change the temperature at which this exchange happens.